Scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not part of the body because I am not a hand, then does that make it any less part of the body? And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable, those we clothe with greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is part of it. Well, as we've been emphasizing for many weeks now, I think, and this is actually our, is this our last? No, we have one more week. One more, yeah, two more weeks of uh, looking at uh, what God does after the resurrection, after Easter. And we've been emphasizing the way that God creates this new community, this new people under the Lordship of Christ called church. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit does, brings people together into this new community, people who otherwise wouldn't have had anything probably to do with one another, people who were Jews and Gentiles and slaves and free, uh, people who were from high and low status. And we heard last week that God does this not just for uh, our own individual benefit, that God gives us gifts, but in fact, God does this for the common good. And what is this microphone doing? Has anyone else seen this? Uh, <laughs> Paul, you might need to help me, actually. That's just sort of a going. Yeah, Paul has the gift of microphones, uh, whereas uh, where I, as I'm less gifted with microphones. I think, I think that should be good, because um, I know you want to hear, so uh, we'll make sure you get that chance. So th the Spirit uh, gives a variety of gifts for the upbuilding of community. And as we heard that even this passage goes as far to say is that, that God gives gifts exactly uh, for the community so that composing the body exactly as God would have it uh, for the good of one another, for the glory of God. And I think if only it were so simple, uh, perhaps you've been a part of a church where you look around and you think, you know, perhaps the Holy Spirit should be just a bit more generous uh, because there seems to be a lot of gifts that we lack, in fact, and to think, well, is, is this exactly who we're supposed to be, exactly who God wants us to be? And if we're honest, we have to admit that we don't think that all gifts are equal. And, and more to the point, we think that some people are more gifted than others. We're very used to speaking this way. In fact, we struggle to see that some people are gifted at all that they have anything that we need. It's probably an unavoidable aspect of human nature that we place, some, we place greater value on some gifts than others, and thus on more, uh, some more value on some people 
than others. Uh, we, we tend to think of people in terms of what can they do, and often what can they do for me. Uh, their value is instrumental. A faction of the Corinthians were operating under the assumption that the gift of tongues was superior to all the others, likely because it was more dramatic, uh, more spiritual, obviously, uh, and possibly more uncommon. It's not clear if those who had this gift rose to prominence because they had the gift, or if because they were already the more uh, higher status people who had this gift, maybe that's why. Uh, the gift was considered the best. Frequently, uh, we value what influential people tell us we ought to value. Uh, this is what uh, celebrity advertising is all about. Uh, you know, oh, they use that product, I should too. It's perhaps, you know, the, the powerful influential Corinthians say, this is the best gift, and everyone else says, well, I guess they must be right. Uh, the elevation of this gift above all others meant that um, some people were exalted, the people who had that gift, while other people were marginalized. Those who had the fanciest gifts presumed that they must be divinely favored, uh, spiritually blessed, and thus spiritually superior, while those with much more mundane gifts or no apparent gifts at all were considered less blessed, if not spiritually defective. Uh, and this sort of scenario still plays out where uh, in some places and times, you know, we look at some people and think, well, your lack of, of giftness, giftedness must, uh, as far as I can tell, you know, that must say something about your spirituality. And so the, spirit, the superior spiritual people regard or disregard the inferior, less spiritual people and presume that their position is its own justification. Well, since I've been elevated, I, I am in a natural position to then put down these other people to say that they're not important. Now, we might consider ourselves fortunate to be a uh, part of a church that doesn't uh, elevate the gift of tongues. Perhaps, maybe some of you wish we did. Uh, but there are still other gifts that we as a people and we as individuals uh, who participate in a broader culture, value over others. Which again, necessarily means that we ascribe more value to some people than others. We might not want to be people who do this. We might not like to think of ourselves that way. Uh, we might be even unaware that we do that, but we still do it. We just think that some people are better and some people are less gifted. And to some extent or another, we are all conscious of, possibly even preoccupied with, our status relative to those around us. Some of us see ourselves low and unvalued, without appreciated or useful gifts. Others of us are confident that we are the gifted people, uh, the ones who have what others need that whatever gift we have is best, necessarily because it's the gift that we have. Uh, some of us think what we have is not important. Some of us are convinced that whatever we have must be the best because why else would I have it? Um, some of us feel like we are not needed. Like if we disappeared, no one would care. Like we don't really have anything to contribute. Nothing would be affected if we weren't here. No one would miss us. Some of us think we are important and take pride in possessing rarefied abilities. And of course, we all participate in, a, in an economy that uh, reinforces all this. You know, supply meets demand. You know, your value as a person, your compensation is based on the rarity of your skills. And it's hard for us to imagine a different kind of economy of value. And this is why this metaphor of the body of Christ is so crucial uh, to what it means to be a church, to what it means to be Christian. Paul paints the absurd picture of the foot, declaring that it's not a part of the body because it's not a hand, or the ear denying its membership because it's not an eye. They might think, I, I'm self-sufficient in myself. I'm the best. I'm the hand. 
I don't need you, foot. Uh, oh, th thank you. Uh, um, if the whole body were made up of eyes, it's, you know, it's quite obvious where, you know, where would the sense of hearing or smell be, a a among many other things. It just couldn't do it. And Paul says this for the benefit of those who feel like, uh, well, both perhaps for, for the benefit of those who think that, that they would like to stand off and think I'm self-sufficient, yeah, I don't need anyone else, but, but also for the benefit of those who think the gift that they have is uh, unnecessary or um, just doesn't make any difference, doesn't contribute anything. Say no, for, to be a, a healthy functioning body, we need that gift. And then he, he goes on to say um, that if everyone, you know, again, had the same gift, I mean, what, what, what would, how could we function as a church? How could we, we function as a body? We wouldn't be a body at all. And likewise, the eye cannot say to the hand, nor the head to the feet, I don't need you. There, there's some of us that like to be really self-sufficient, right? To think, I don't, I don't need anyone else. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a contained unit. Like, I don't, I, I exist, you know, on my own, independent of everyone else. I don't need anyone. Um, and, and Paul's basically exposing this as a lie. Um, those that think that their gift might ele elevate them above all other people are reminded that, no, actually, uh, you need other people. Uh, the body is entirely dependent upon the gifts of others. So perhaps the obvious point, the, the, the lesson, the moral that's normally drawn is that, that none of us have all the gifts and uh, that all of us have a necessary gift. And so we should come to peace with what God has given us and accept that we don't have everything we want and to use what we do have uh, to benefit one another. And that's true as far as it goes. But it's, it's too self-centered, a reading of the passage. Uh, it still, it puts, puts you know, ourselves uh, looking from the inside out. And as we've said many times recently, uh, as, as modern, uh, mostly Western people here, we are very individualistic. And this is not necessarily to say that we're selfish. It's not quite the same thing, although we often are selfish. Uh, but to be individualistic is... It means that we think of ourselves primarily as individuals rather than as members of a group. And this is, this is very modern in many ways. We tend to focus on the gifts we possess or lack as individuals, uh, not the gifts that we have uh, and share within community. Another way of, of saying this is that modern people want to create their own identity instead of being given an identity. We want to be free. Whether we like it or not, membership in any group necessarily forms part of our identity. Whatever group you're a part of, uh, that somehow you take part of your identity from that. Uh, if it's a, a sports club or any association, you, you, it, it shapes you a little bit. But Paul is telling us we are to find our ultimate, our overarching identity in the body of Christ. So in the terms of this body metaphor, it's not just that the hand, for instance, only fulfills its ultimate purpose when it's connected to the body, although that's true. It's that a hand isn't really a hand at all unless it's part of the body. The hand is defined by its attachment to the rest of the body. It is what it is only because it finds itself in relation to the arm and uh, the chest and the heart and the lungs. Uh, without these things, it really is nothing. It shrivels and dies. A, a hand cut off uh, and just sitting here, it's, it's useless. It does nothing. It's not a hand in any real sense. It's no less preposterous for a Christian to claim self-sufficiency than it is for a hand to exist on its own, apart from the body. Its flourishing relies upon the flourishing of the other members. 
Its gifts are most fully realized only when the other gifts reach their full potential. I and mean, if, if the hand wants to be healthy, it needs the health of the body. This isn't to say that when we be, become Christian that we lose our individuality. We are not meant to understand ourselves as mere cogs in a machine called the body of Christ. No, the hand, the eye, the ear remain distinct. We can speak in terms of uh, my hand hurts or my, my foot is sore. And we don't just say my body hurts. Um, no, these things remain distinct, but they're entirely dependent on one another. You, you can't you know, take them apart and, and keep them alone. And in fact, they are never truly more free, never more fully empowered, more fully who they were meant to be who they truly are than when they find themselves connected to the body, working in harmony with the other parts. And consider for a moment how differently our culture conceives of individuality, of freedom, of self-actualization. We are all here, for better or for worse, children of the Enlightenment, a movement still ongoing which seeks to free individuals from the constraints of history, of tradition, of any other imposed obligation. We want to put all those things behind us so that we can pursue the future that we want. And our modern ideal is to be free to choose our own destiny unencumbered by our past. And if we're honest, that's probably why some of us are uh, expats, right? We want to escape. Uh, the limitations of where we were so that we can be free, new people in this new place where we can show up and no one knows who we are. Uh, we want to be free, to be true to ourselves without asking exactly where that self came from in the first place. Where did this true to, true to yourself self come from? In our own self-sufficiency, we want to be fulfilled, to be happy, to have all of our dreams come true. We don't want to need anything other than what we've freely chosen. It's okay to have needs, but, but we want to choose them for ourselves. We, we, want to, we want to select our attachments. And so our freedom requires avoiding constraints and avoiding the constraints of people who don't have something to offer us. And no wonder people are so lonely. I mean, we isolate ourselves. That, that's what we do in so many ways. And that's probably why a lot of you are here. It's because you know that's, that's happening in your life. And you think, this isn't good. I need to be with people. As some of you know, I spent almost three years living in uh, the L'Arche community in Washington, D.C. Uh, L'Arche was founded by Jean Vanier in 1964 in France when he came to know uh, a few young men who had disabilities whom the uh, institutions either could not or would not care for. So he decided to invite these men into his home and to share life with them. And it, and it wasn't just happily ever after. Uh, it, it soon became apparent, in fact, that one of the men he just couldn't care for but now there are uh, 147 communities in 35 countries which seek to live according to the same spirit of welcome. In large, the permanent residents are called core members because it is they whom the community gathers around. And, and some of these people have really profound disabilities. Uh, they're, they're the sort of people that you would maybe look upon with pity, uh, the sort of people that if you were of a certain mindset would say, boy, those people use a lot of resources and they don't really contribute much. Um, but in large, it was their gifts that were celebrated, their needs and desires that gave direction to the community. And it's easy to over-romanticize life there. Uh, people, when I tell them I, I, I live there, they act like I'm a saint. Um, I, I, I was, I mean, I'm me. Um, it's often dull and difficult, and, and frequently I didn't really like it. And one of the, my frustrations that I had to come to terms with 
was that the gifts I thought I had weren't really that useful. I mean, I showed up as someone thinking, like, I've got, I've got a lot of stuff that, that you guys probably need. Um, the fact that I was well-educated, for instance, was basically useless. Uh, and, and particularly the, the core members, uh, the fact that I have degrees, do they care? No, nor should they. It doesn't, doesn't affect them. It doesn't touch them. Um, I found myself in a community where, quite literally, in the words of Paul, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater respect, with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. It wasn't easy. I, did, I, didn't, I was used to playing by the rules of the world, right? I, I was used to like, you know, certain things being valued and other things. And here we are in a, a Christ-like community and it's not always easy. I think these communities capture an aspect of what church is to be better even than church does itself. Uh, not least because they are focused, uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, frustratingly on relationship, uh, of sharing your life with one another. I was forced to share my life in ways that I didn't always want to. Uh, I wanted sometimes to have my own space. I didn't want to talk about my feelings, you know, I, um, but I, I, I had to. And it turns out that when we share our life together, that the very people who seem uh, expendable are actually essential. Because they have uh, no upward mobility, uh, we have to practice a kind of downward mobility in which, in which we discover what it really is to be human. And not only did they have gifts, they had gifts we really needed. In a very real sense, our life depend, depended on them. This is God's economy of value. Well, typically when Paul or I make an appeal for you to get involved in the life of the church, we do so on the basis that the church has needs uh, and someone needs to do the work. Uh, we tell you, you have gifts and please use your gifts. We want to create a sense of obligation and responsibility. And that remains true. But today I want to appeal to you in slightly different terms. Uh, according to your own enlightened self-interest. Uh, even according to your own individualistic, uh, possibly selfish person. Uh, I know what that's like, uh, myself. Um, if you want to be happier, more fulfilled, if you want a greater sense of purpose and identity, if you want to know who you are, then find your place in the body of Christ. You will be most truly yourself when you connect to other people. Your gifts will find their truest, fullest expression when used within the context for which they were created. You will be most free paradoxical as it seems, when you bind yourself to other people. We sang songs about Holy Spirit come, change us. Um, we've been talking the last few weeks about where is the Holy Spirit? Where where's the Spirit dwell? The Spirit dwells in the church. Not to say the Spirit can't touch your life elsewhere. Um, but the more we get connected here, the more we are connected to the life of the Spirit. This isn't to say this is a perfect church by any means. Uh, is it, it's not like, you know, you, you join a group and then your life changes dramatically. Uh, the same is true for small groups. And let's be honest. Not every meeting of every small group is loads of fun. They don't all have life-changing teaching every week. Uh, there isn't always emotional intimacy. Um, Sometimes it doesn't feel like anything happens at all. Sometimes you walk away thinking, I didn't get anything out of that because we're people who want to get something out of it. What you get out of a small group, what you get out of church, the way it changes your life 
is through the often mundane reality of, over time, being a part of a community gathered in Jesus' name. This is what God wants for us. And not in like a, uh, God's going to be angry if you don't do it sort of way, but this is what God really wants for you in the way that a father wants best for the children. This is what you were made for. You were given your gifts exactly for this. And here is both the sign and the blessing of true community. I think this is, hits really to the heart of what we want as people. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. It's a gift to discover. I mean, the gift is to discover that you are a member of a community. And finally, this is God's gift to us, uh, the gift of one another uh, with his spirit present. Uh, this is why we're here. So let's, let's try to make it happen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the gifts you have given us. And we pray that, uh, that we would first see our gifts. We, we pray that even that we would be people that know each other well enough that we could see the gifts in others and call them forth. Help us not to, uh, to hide our gifts. Help of us not to think more than we are but to use all that we're given uh, for the good of one another, uh, for the glory of God. Uh, and so help us not to be uh, hesitant to connect, to become committed. Uh, help us to see a new way to be free. Uh, free not from, but free for. Free for the life uh, for which you've created us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.